Welcome to the Travel Man Podcast with your host Ben. And on today's podcast, I'll be having my dear old father on. He'll be talking to us about his recent trip to New York, also about how much he loves Airbnb and Air Canada. So stay tuned. Okay, Dad, thanks for um, joining me on my podcast, Travel Man Podcast. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. But your intro, your dear old dad, I mean, yeah. this is this is just a bit much, Benjamin. I'm, I'm only 403, after all, <laughs> and been around for a while, but to be yeah. a dear old at my age is a bit well, confronting. We won't, we won't tell anyone your Let's age then. Let's not dwell on it. Okay, no. let's not. Let's just get into it then. Right. So you're on Air Canada's inaugural flight from Melbourne to Vancouver. You said it could have been better. Uh, why? Well, um, here we were, the 3rd of December 2017, on the first Air Canada inaugural flight from Melbourne to Vancouver. And as people who know their maps well and have flown a bit, yep. we'll know that that's a, a pretty long distance. Uh, it's a, an important flight, you would think, for Air Canada. I got to the airport and they had all these incredibly boring speeches set up <laughs> in a kind of a tent that, that they had snowmen in and they always have to have everything to do with Canada has those silly men with the scout hats and the red coats, the Mounties, and they had a few of those hanging around. And in Melbourne? In Melbourne, before you got on the plane. Really? We're at the... At the um, Boarding gate. Were they Canadians? Oh, well, uh, yes, they're all the most boring men from <laughs> Vancouver and Air Canada. All the executives who had to stick in their bit, you know, the, the, the chief engineer of Air Canada. What a wonderful day there says today to be able to fly from Melbourne to Canada. And all the passengers, you know, yes. the 300 of us or whatever there were, yeah. um, the plane wasn't full full, but it was pretty full. Yeah. Um, we were just... <laughs> Hanging around, um, uh, you know, waiting for our champers because it was an inaugural flight. Do you think Air Canada handed out any champagne, let alone Aussie or Canadian <laughs> bubbly, before we got on board or actually in the plane? Of course not. What we were given... Was a bit of moose. A bit, bit, you know, because it was an, inaug in, an inaugural flight. Yep. Was a cookie, one of those stupid big American cookies. Oh, like an which, Anzac biscuit? It, well, you know, it was just sort of flat and had icing on it. All the things oh, that gross. are really, really great for diabetics. Oh, yeah, uh, like fantastic. Like myself, you know, so I threw, you. threw that out immediately. Yeah. And then they gave us a tiny little pin of an aeroplane, which we were to just stick in our lapels. I didn't see anybody doing it. Okay. With a bit of um, Air Canada livery on it. And so that was the introduction to the flight. I thought it was utterly pathetic. There are a few kind of sandwiches and things hanging around. Yeah. Which at 11 o'clock in the morning or whatever was, um, you know, I thought, well, it's okay to provide that, but to have... Boring speeches, you know, and I think there were I think there were Australian, there were Melburnians there of, of some executive capacity. Yeah. So uh, we got on the flight, and it's of course quicker um, going west to east than east to west because you're yeah. ki kicking with the wind. And, kicking with the wind, and yes, That's an Australian <laughs> colloquialism. You get up with the in the jet stream, and it goes west to east. So that's that, true. So that's right. In summary, Air Canada, I mean, the thing that's most memorable about Air Canada is the average age of the cabin oh. staff, mostly women. Yeah. And I reckoned it would have been in the early 60s. Well, so perhaps the oldest, that's positive. the oldest woman cabin uh, crew yeah. would have been pff, late 60s, I suppose. And late 60s, that's pretty old. And they're pretty, they're pretty broad in the beam. These, <laughs> the, 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 these women. And the, the, th the thing, I had an aisle oh. seat. I had an aisle seat. Yeah. And the trouble is, for 14 and a half hours, you got bum whacked <laughs> every, every so often as they made their, as they did their job up and down the aisles. Sounds not like fun. 
Not only were their trolleys um, careening up and down the aisles, <laughs> but their bums were as well. <laughs> oh, my God. And you got hit in the shoulder or the elbow the whole time. So the, 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 the food wasn't too bad. And as we know, airline food, like Air Canada. What, what would, was the food, Dad? Was spec- it would specify. It was airline food. I can't okay. remember the dishes. But, Nothing, but yeah. they were quite good and, and of quite good quality. And the airline would specify what it wants out of Melbourne or out of Vancouver yeah. in terms of food. And I think in both directions, the food was pretty good. Fair the, enough. The onboard um, entertainment was atrocious. There were about 31 films you could watch um, on on the back of you, on the seat in front of That's you. That's okay. You know, the, the, 31's all right. No, but they're all... Terrible American pap, nothing European, nothing good. Oh, it was just okay. basically crap movies. Yep. The music was even worse. I like classical music, and I think there were 11 um, CDs on the thing. Didn't you, of, didn't you load up your MP3 player? Or yes, iPod? I did. Of course I did. But, but you expect much better. And the, yeah, to enough. compare it with Singapore Airlines or Cathay Pacific, it's just chalk and cheese and Air Canada's... Um, Air Canada's contribution and offerings were just absolutely terrible. Yeah. Um, they were disgraceful when you're flying on the way back 15 and a half hours and you're 16 or more hours actually in the aeroplane, wow. which I don't like anyway. The seats don't, um, now, nowadays, the yep. seats don't um, fold back. And um, well, they don't very go, far. They don't yeah, recline. I re- think recline enough, yeah. They don't recline very much at all. Um, there seemed to be a very tight pitch from one seat to the next, so you didn't seem to have a lot of leg room. I noticed it more on the way over than on the way back, which was, which well, perhaps it was a misperception of me. I don't know. But um, and uh, I um, um, I don't like those particular planes, the Dreamliners or whatever the, they are. Yeah, the Dreamliners, seven eight seven Boeing. They, they um, there's something strangely uncomfortable. About them, uh, I okay. don't know what it is. I think the seats aren't very felt comfortable. Cramped. They're cramped. Um, what about the cabin just, size? Felt cramped as it's well. It's just a terrible plane, and and it brings me to the the much more important point of airlines in general. And I divide them into two sorts. There are those for whom their business class passengers, yeah, are much more important than their economy class passengers. And there are airlines where the reverse is true. And the Asian airlines, I think, look after their economy class passengers much better. I flew economy Singapore Airlines to uh, London and back last year or the year before last. Yeah. And they even provide sockets for walking around the plane. Mm. Um, The food is excellent. The onboard... um, uh, offerings, entertainment is terrific. Yeah. Cathay is similar, and you know, your mother, my wife, worked yep. for Cathay, so, so listeners can sort of 20 take, years. take that for what, it's, well. for what it's worth. Um, but uh, Air Canada has the, um, has the temerity to class its business class passengers to the gods, while the people down the back are just rubbish and are treated as rubbish. They're just the the, the cattle in the droves, in in the back pen, so to speak, of the of the airliner. And I think Air Canada falls into that category. When you cross the states with them, as I did, I went from Vancouver to New York. You, you get no food. They they give you um, drinks, uh, mm. non, non-alcoholic drinks, but if you want to buy food, you have to buy these little packages of food, like a packaged hot dog or hamburger or whatever it is, and it's all wrapped up in uh, in paper and sealed. And you have to buy those on board. They do not do not um, hand them out. I see, mm. I've read a piece recently that suggests that more and more American airlines that really all operate like this, I understand, I might be wrong in one or two cases, but certainly yeah. the majority of cases, you do not get to eat free food handed out, even nibbles and snacks and American Airlines, they're now going to take out the um, uh, the entertainment on the back of the seat in front of you because those devices that allow you to dial up and look at movies and all the rest yep. of it cost anything up to $10,000 per seat to... Um, to install in an airline seat. So think of the cost of that, plus the weight, the extra weight. And what the airlines are trying to do these days in their economic madness is to reduce 
uh, both the weight of airlines and the costs that they're involved in. And um, For sure. uh, so you'll see increasingly airlines like Air Canada, I think, providing no um, in-flight entertainment and uh, providing only the most rudimentary food. And I think even in long haul, you might have to buy it uh, at some time in the future. Okay. So... With that Air Canada flight that you mentioned earlier, was that more like a domestic flight, though? Well, if you can call five hours from Vancouver to New York domestic. Um, I think uh, they think of it as a domestic flight, not an actual I, I don't care. international. I don't care how they, how they categorise it. It goes from Canada to the United States of America. Now, that in anybody's definition is not domestic. Moreover, it's a long flight, five hours... Four and a half hours one way, five hours kicking into the wind. And um, uh, I think it's just atrocious for this atrocious airline, Air Canada, to behave in that manner. But it doesn't, it couldn't care less about its economy class Mm. passengers, as I say. It's like uh, Qantas that survives because it has this monopoly over Australian business people who all fly. Qantas because their businesses have been connected with the Qantas executives and the Qantas sales hierarchy for decades and decades. Mm. And I suspect the same thing applies in Canada, where Air Canada has this monopoly over um, Canadian businessmen and businesswomen whose uh, whose companies have had this long-term, decades-long connection with the national carrier. Airlines like Air, uh, Cathay and Thai and Singapore Airlines have connections beyond, far beyond their national uh, borders. Their, their markets are in Australia and, uh, and China and other countries that, that they must put on an effort for in mm-hmm. the name of their own country. Their own people are not providing the market that they need. So, so you they think have that's to, why they try a little bit harder? Absolutely. And that's why they have to perform. And that's why they do perform. So I'd just say in general, n- n- always try to fly Asian and Middle Eastern airlines. Never try to fly Western, American, Canadian or Australian airlines. That's a fair point. But I did have a fantastic flight over to LA from Melbourne with Qantas just last year, and they pulled out all stops. They were fine. They were really good. In in economy? Yeah, in economy. I was in the A380, which I still believe is the most comfortable plane to be sat in for at least 14, 15 hours. You have the space. You have the leg room. You've got got the room above your head. You don't actually feel like you're in a cramped or condensed space. So, look, I... I understand where you're coming from. I haven't flown with Air Canada, so I can't really comment. But I have flown in a 787 Dreamliner and it was cramped for me also. Mm. Yeah, well, so they're, they're a- it might be that. But look, a positive from your Air Canada experience is that you did, you did say that there was air, uh, flight attendants that were in their 60s. That's yeah. a great thing that they actually employ people of older age. Well, it's great that, that people of uh, older people are getting and keeping jobs, but you'd expect a mix of old and young. Well, you know, fair enough. That's your opinion. Well, well I'm entitled to it too. Well, let's move on, can well, we? Um, I'm sick of Air Canada. Yeah, I know, I can <laughs> tell. You're really getting into them. I probably will never be able to fly Air Canada ever again. Well, um, Travel I, Man I, podcast. I, I hope you don't. <laughs> okay, well, um, you booked your accommodation in New York through Airbnb. Um, I I heard that you love Airbnb. Is this true? Absolutely untrue, Benjamin. Oh, my God. Uh, Here we, we go. My wife and I have had several experiences now with Airbnb, and I think it's a, a quite a dodgy organisation. Um, I've managed to close down a bloke in Malta. Um, <laughs> because what, Really? Yes, because I put uh, I criticised him to such a degree that he withdrew his uh, apartment from um, from Airbnb and and sent me an email to say he'd have to try again or something. And yes, okay. absolutely, he'd need to try harder. The place was a, an absolute disgrace in terms of cleanliness and mm. all the rest. Of it. The problem with there are many problems with Airbnb. One is that it's 
it's um, the people who set it up, who are clearly multi squillionaires by now, set it up for purposes of greed, of course, as most that you know the world runs on greed, and the sure. whole of the whole of business and the whole of um, of um, commerce um, exists for profit. And uh, they set up a quite a brilliant um, business model, which um, relinquishes all responsibility from them for the standards of uh, of what is presented by the people who offer properties on Airbnb. They 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 live in this uh, totally un- in a true bubble. world. Uh, the the executives of, of Airbnb. Oh, yeah. Live in a bubble and know quite well that what people are putting up on screens and what offering for properties uh, is likely to be completely untrue, or at least partly untrue about the property. Mm. Um, and um, I I chose a property in Brooklyn, in New York, and, and now Brooklyn is. Um, is the other? It's not on the it's island not, of Manhattan. Yeah, Manhattan it's yeah. the other side of the East River, um, and it's quite a big borough of New York borough. But I saw that the property, the apartment that I was hiring, was uh, near a subway station, which was most important to me. They said um, the women who put mm. the property up for Airbnb said that it was a twenty-five minute. Subway ride to uh, Manhattan. Oh, yeah. Um, it's double that. It was more than double that. And I had a conference to go to in Manhattan and it was... So they gave you some false information. Totally false information. They needed to be much more specific and say that their subway station, Rockaway Park, um, was two stops from an express station that would take you through to Manhattan in your half gotcha. an hour. The subway uh, uh, clearly needs millions and millions and hundreds of millions of dollars uh, spent on it because there are a lot of stoppages, there are a lot of go slows in the subway system. And it took me anything from, I think, 45 minutes was the quickest I did it, up to about an hour and 15 minutes to the centre of Manhattan from where I was. Wow. Um, no indication, of course, either in the Airbnb um, advertisement or in the material which was really wanting left in the property for people who hired it as to the area, as to what was available, as to um, – there was a kind of a rudimentary map, but that's about it. Um, and the the – the, the, the property, the apartment I was in, um, must be one of two or more uh, that are run by two women and as, as a business. So yeah. under Airbnb, you've got all these little businesses run as franchises, but Airbnb take no responsibility for the information they put out, for the um, – for the, mm. for the, where I was, and it doesn't say this in any yeah. of the material, was a very bleak part of Brooklyn. Um, so it didn't say it in any of the reviews didn't by say other it, people? No, uh, and I'll get to that in just a minute. Okay. Um, it was a bleak part of Brooklyn. It was quite littered. There were some nice houses in some of the suburbs nearby. Yeah. There, was, there were no interesting shops. There were just corner shops, one or two corner shops. What the information failed to say was that there was a terrific supermarket two blocks away. The apartment itself was fine, was nice. You know, terrific kitchen, brand new uh, stove, good cooking equipment in general, terrific fridge, very comfortable bed. All those things were great. I've, I had trouble um, getting onto the internet because I didn't find this information about how to do it. The Wi-Fi? The, the, the oh, information right. booklet that oh, right. they have, the file, was in a drawer under the TV, which was stuck. And when I was looking around for something about the apartment and how to work all the stuff, I didn't find this till quite late. Oh, um, right. And, okay. and I, so I had trouble getting in touch with the women who, the two young women who run the the apartment, I said at one stage, do you run this as a business? And they said, yes. At no stage did they ever come around to see me or to answer my questions personally or to talk to me face-to-face about the apartment, the area that I was living in, the Brooklyn area where I was. Um, that was 
tremendously disappointing too, I think. Mm. Now, getting back to Airbnb recommendations, there's a bit of a... Um, uh, they tend to... Um, what's the word? Not... Um, there's a bit of ransom going on here because what Airbnb say yeah. is you have X amount of time to file your review of this property yeah. with them, X number of days or whatever. So, um, and it's only until you do that that you will find out what the landlord says about you mm. as a guest. I thought so, you could do it at any stage. I thought the landlord could do it before you or you could do it before the landlord. Well, I don't know about that, but it's a, it's a crook setup because it just advantages the people at Airbnb, the executives who are clearing off with the squillions each year. You see what works here. The only thing that w will work here for everybody's satisfaction is that everybody says good things about one another. The other point about this is I've been a professional critic all my life mm. and my views are worth money. They used to be worth a lot of money at restaurants. And to have me make a full review of the apartment where I lived in Brooklyn mm. for nine days I would have done it. It would have required an hour or so of my time. Um, I would have done it with great accuracy and a lot of detail. No one does that because no one wants to have a landlord say about them that they I didn't like. Bad. They did. I didn't like this person because he was so critical, or uh, you know, Stephen was okay, but he was very demanding. I mean, mm. the lock of the the second security door lock was so dodgy that I yeah. got them to change that. Um, I, I complained on the first day. There was no toaster in the... No toaster? What no are they toaster thinking? in the kitchen. And they said, well, we don't supply a toaster. Well, I said, I want one. And that was outside the front door of the apartment the next day. Yeah. Um, the lock they repaired after hmm. three days, two days before I left. And... And keys, you, to get into the key box, it was highly complex. It was okay. freezing cold. My hands were nearly dropping off every time I had to do that. And then you couldn't close. There were so many keys to get in. One, two, three, and there were a spare keys. So there might Why have so been, many keys? I don't know, but then there were about five keys. It wouldn't fit in the security box outside the door, which had a system. If I'd left one day without my book, with all the information on how to get in with the security codes, yep. and come back and they changed the lock then, <laughs> I wouldn't have got in. I wouldn't have got in if I'd not been able to get into the security box. I thought it was a pathetic effort, um, and these people need to be shown up. I haven't bothered to write a review because I know that Airbnb, Airbnb just profits from my stuff. It's Look, it's, it's just mad, mad consumer commerce gone, capitalism gone mad and, and the way greed, greed dominates everything, the Airbnb people are among the most greedy. That's fair enough. Look, I've had a good, I've had some good experiences with Airbnb and I've had another experience where the, the guy that um, we were renting his place off was quite, was fairly new, it was his first time and it was in Manly. And yeah, he didn't have a toaster, he didn't have this, he didn't have that. Mandy and I actually went out to the shops and bought him a toaster, bought him, um, there was a few other essential things he didn't have. Ooh. And we told him in the message that we'd bought him this stuff and that he would give us money back. It took a little while, but he eventually gave us our money back for the things we actually bought for his place. And that was his, my experience. And it was expensive. That was my experience in Sunshine Beach. The kitchen was completely unequipped and there was no table to eat at. Um, this was a recent Airbnb and the bloke said, oh, gee, I'm just new at this. Go to any shop, buy what you like, mm. and I'll pay you back. And two days later, he did. But this this is amateur hour. Well, yeah. You know, this is Airbnb. Airbnb are amateurs. Hang on. A Benjamin. lot of them. Airbnb are responsible for this. The, yeah. the big bosses. Do you think they care? They could not give us stuff. Could well, not give us stuff. They're just perhaps greedy capitalists. Not perhaps, of I course. Think They're running a business that that lines their pockets yeah. with millions of dollars every year and they have no responsibility and it's absolutely gutless of them. Well, it looks like you love Airbnb and, and that's... <laughs> Look... Maybe you've just um, had a few bad experiences. Yes, I, would, I have. I would continue with them. No, 
because, I wouldn't because... Uh, but it's but better than a hotel. Me, may I advise listeners? Cheaper. Yeah. Oh, well, New York, it's impossible. You see, that was the other good thing about this property, the apartment in Brooklyn. But you was said the property was great, though. Relative, the property your was, experience relative, the was relatively cheap per night. And you said the bed was comfy, the, the place was nice. Yes. That's all positives. And if I'd been in Manhattan in a hotel, three to $400 a night. New York seems to have got horribly expensive. Well, America's expensive. Well, it, it, depending Fran's on the dollar, it's, it's not. When you go out to the countryside, America, out in the in the in the Midwest, who wants to go there? Well, there's some wonderful things to do. Wonderful touring, car touring. There's lots of great stuff in America that you can do cheaply. Fair enough. You don't have to go to the big cities, which are expensive. Well, I remember an Airbnb experience I had in Japan, and it was fantastic. Our our man Jun, I think his name was, met us outside of the place. He was there, um, willing to take um, give us any questions that we had to answer. Um, there was also another time in Potts Point where the man was there waiting for us. He gave us a list of things to do around Sydney. Uh, we've had some really good experiences of people that are organised. Their places yes. are fantastic no, and yes, great. But- but my point is, it shouldn't be. It should be like that all the time. It shouldn't be pot luck. But this I, is yeah. this is this is amateurish of Airbnb to take no responsibility for the service they offer because they franchise it out. It's a brilliant, brilliant capitalist um, business model, and uh, no doubt the Airbnb people who own it, I don't know who they are, they're Americans, no doubt, they'll be sitting back in California laughing their asses off, as the Americans say, and pocketing the money. Fair enough. Shocking, shocking. Look, anyway, the thing, if I can yeah. suggest to listeners, anyone listening, that the thing to do when you're trying to acquire a property to rent on a short term is try other companies that are comparable with Airbnb and also local real estate agents. They're, the, they're often the best people to help you into apartment because they're professional. They've got to provide a professional service. Airbnb is full of a bunch of amateurs who offer less than the best mm. and it's Absolutely potluck if you get something good. You still don't believe that if you read a review, it's not no, 100% the re- accurate? the reviews are, are absolutely unimportant. Why? Because of that, that um, the system they work, so that everybody's got to write something good yeah. in, or, in order to see what the other person writes. So it's a bit of blackmail there. You know, it's, it's um, you know, I'll do this for you only if you do this for me type of stuff. So the reviews, you can just discount them. Absolutely. Discount any reviews on Airbnb. Fair enough. And um, oh, all right, great. So we had a lovely conversation about Airbnb. Yep. Now, um, what about your actually your experience in New York City this time? Because I know you've been. Before. I've been to New York several times. Uh, How was it this time? Usually loved the place. I was going for a conference, and the weather right. wasn't the best. Do you want to tell the cold. listeners um, what conference you were oh, at? Oh, not really. And why it was you about were there? no. It was about um, publishing and publishing. You're doing independent, your PhD though, aren't you? Independent publishing, and so I was there to um, to get try to get some leads to publish um, a novel that's part of my PhD. But anyway, Fair that's enough. beside the Sounds point. Sounds boring. I, yeah, well, it probably is for you, Benjamin, and a lot of listeners, but that's I'm prepared to well, this is a travel accept podcast. that. Yes, of course. Nothing to do with travel. Nothing. But uh, uh, New York has changed in that it's vastly more expensive now, I think. The best place to eat is Le Relais de Venise, or okay. L'Entrecote. There are now two of them in um, New York. They started in... Paris about 50 years ago, and I remember Dominic and I, your mother, and I used to queue up in the snow in the 1970s to go to the first and the original L'Entrecote in the, uh, near, in the Avenue de la Grande Armée, which is west of, um, um, west of uh, Lac de Triomphe. Ooh. And we went there, and since then, the granddaughter of the woman and, who set up L'Entrecote in Paris has diversified or not diversified but has taken models exact models of l'entrecote 
And I think there are two in London. Models, in, do you mean the actual your, the way the restaurant the looks? The way the restaurant is and the way it sets up and, you, okay. and, and the way it looks and all the rest of it. There's one, I think, in Amsterdam and two in New York. Uh, I went for the first time because I've been to the other one a couple of times. I went for the first time to the second one in southern Manhattan. Uh, it was terrific. You start with a walnut... Um, Salad. And lettuce salad, and yep. then you have steak and chips, and oh. they, they provide the beautiful uh, steak, uh, fillet steak, and a, a kind of a mustardy, tarragony oh sauce. Um, Sounds And uh, with a bottle of wine, myself and another bloke from the conference, we paid about $50 US each. Um, which, no, $50 Australian. Australian. Each. I was going to say, if it was 50 uh, USD, it would be 75 or something. Fantastic value in New York. It's the best value in New York and the best okay. eating in New York. Le Roulet, Le, L-E, R-E-L-A-I-S, D-E, Venise, V-E-N-I-S-E. I'll look put, it up. Look yeah, it up. I'll put it in the show notes in this podcast. Yeah, it's so an easy, it uh, there's, a, there's um, obviously an online presence and uh, tells, tells you all about it. So basically, I went back to Cat's Deli, which I've been to two or three times now. Very disappointing. I had the pastrami on rye, the famous pastrami on rye. What was uh, wrong deli. with it? This is a famous Jewish deli where, and the walls are plastered with neon lights and pictures of the famous people who've eaten there, the, oh, yeah. the film stars and the famous singers. Is your picture there? Not, not there. No. And you buy um, the sandwich. Now, it's about... Slices of pastrami, corned beef, very salty, beautifully tender, mm. tasty, but far too salty on two oval bits, small oval bits of bread. But the sandwich is about um, 10 centimetres, 12 centimetres high. So lots of, of slices of wow. pastrami, and um, but too salty, spoiled it. And you get these strange uh, pickled cucumbers, one lot sweet and one quite big, actually, you know, pickles. And sour and salty again. On the side I, of the I was plate. disappointed. I've had yeah. it before. I thought it was much better uh, yeah. the other time. You get a corned beef sandwich. These sandwiches cost in the low twenties of American dollars. I think it must be the world's most expensive sandwich now to be about twenty eight uh, Australian dollars. Wow, for that's me. an expensive sanger. Yeah, I wouldn't go there. I, I wouldn't ever. A lot of people love it. I was with a, my Jewish mate from the conference. He said, "Oh, gee, I, yeah. lo I love cats, Deli." Yeah, and um, but <laughs> he obviously hadn't been there recently. He lives in Chicago, and um, oh, okay. uh, but he, um, you know, it's it's world renowned, and yet it's very disappointing. I'm going to New York this year. Don't I'll, st go to I'll cats. still no, I still want to go there because I love pastrami sandwiches. I love Rubens. Was it a Reuben? Was it a proper Reuben? What's was it Reuben? A, it's a type of sandwich that's what? originated from New York. I don't know. It's got a special sauce in it. No, I just had it's a got bit of mustard, scrape of mustard, scrape of mustard. And the two sourdough um, ovals, which were about the size of a... You Not know, rye? A, a large kidney, I suppose. Okay, because... Kidney shaped too. Right. Okay, yeah. well, I'm still going to go there anyway. Regardless. Anyway, the, 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 the New York um, museums are still terrific, well worth going to. The Brooklyn Museum I went to for the first time, which is absolutely excellent. The second biggest museum in America, Art Museum, had a, a terrific, um, What's several there? terrific exhibitions. Oh, just great pictures, great art, um, like the Met. I went to the Met twice, the Metropolitan. Yep. Um, and that would that, be good. That is fantastic. It has a great exhibition on at the moment of drawings by Michelangelo, and they are oh. absolutely superb. Okay, I might have to go there. Yeah. Um, we're staying in Manhattan, so it might be a little bit tough to get over to Brooklyn, but I've heard Brooklyn's... Oh, the Brooklyn Museum, yeah, it's well worth going to. Okay. It's near a railway line, near a uh, metro station, what's, what's subway. The, what's the boutique beer scene like in Brooklyn? I um, thought it was really good. I, I didn't get to anything in Brooklyn. I went one night before I went to the theatre to a little bar which had several... Uh, Beers, um, uh, beers, but I can't be, I can't say anything expert at all about the the craft beer situation in mm. New York. I'm sure it, there is a lot of mm. of it going on, but I I just didn't get around to that. Also, thought once again that um, they've ruined the Oyster Bar at Grand Central oh, Terminal. Right. 
Um, it's kind of gone sexy and down lighting and, um, you know, low lighting. Um, the, the selections of oysters they no longer have. They used to have massive numbers of craft beer. They don't seem to have that anymore. Oh, okay. I, it, was, it disappointed me so much that I didn't bother going there and I was really looking forward to going back to the oyster bar at Grand Central, but it's no longer the place it used to be. Fair enough. So, but so, other than um, the museums, <clears throat> or the museum that you mentioned in Brooklyn, what else has Brooklyn got to offer people? Um, nothing much, I would think. Uh, it's just there are some kind of there's a downtown big building thing. It probably has some good restaurants, but I didn't bother. I, you know, I cook for myself every night, yeah, except fair one. Um, I don't know is the answer. Do you think what? Um, do you think next time if you go to New York, would you would you stay back in Manhattan? Um, we can't afford to, essentially. Just can't afford to. Yeah. Right. It's and, just um, become so expensive that a private trip now to Manhattan, to New York, um, is out of the question for most people, I would mm, think. Well, we've, we're staying in, is it West Village in Manhattan? Yes, but I think it's West Village. But you're a wealthy man, you and your wife, Benjamin, yeah. and you can afford to do that. You see, we we commoners, commoners, oh who are God. up the back of the plane. <laughs> are you are you saying that I travel first class or no, business? No, I know you go economy. <laughs> I do. I go economy because yeah. I'm not silly. Yeah. Um. Anyway, look, that's about all I've got so listed. That's, and that's, that's all you've got for New York. I've got a few that's questions all I've for got. you. Yes, okay. And, and it's got nothing to do with New York, Airbnb, or Air Canada. Right. Your three pet hates for yep. this to, for, for today's the, podcast. For today's podcast. Um, I was going to ask you what 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 got you into travelling. Um, well, I think you have to. You just that's a when you grow question. up. You you, when you grow up, you. The world, anybody who's curious about the world, and I was always curious as a kid at school about everything. And so when you know that there are different cultures and different places to see and different views and, and different landscapes and different buildings, then curiosity draws you to travel. I think that's the best answer I can give. What about um, you were a journalist that had to... Um Obviously, report overseas like your um, that war in Iraq. Was it Iraq where uh, there was a war? No, <coughs> in the, in the Israel, Israel, where, Israel, where, Arab War that, of nineteen seventy three. What yeah. about that story of you hiding behind a bin? A bin, a no. bin. No, was, I uh, no. They, I was in a bus full of reporters on the Golan Heights, who were being shelled by the Syrian artillery. Okay. And that um, sounds better than my could, bin story. You could see the road heading out to Kanetra, and um, uh, we were on that road, and the Israeli officers with journalists, either in cars or in buses, um, really part of their job was to look after them and make sure that they were safe. And at times that doesn't occur because two journalists, including Nicholas Tomlin, who was a great Sunday Times journalist, were killed couple of days before when they were shot at by the Syrians. Wow. And um, the Syrians were stepping artillery up the road so that every 30 seconds or so there'd be shells coming up the Kanetra Road. There was no uh, Israeli artillery barrage um, shooting back, but that didn't mean much. And then when... A jeep of Israelis went down to an outlying, you could see because it's quite flat, you know, mountains in the distance, yeah. but you could see what was going on, very dusty and moonscapey, but you could see this jeep heading off and when a shell exploded quite near the jeep, it turned around very hurriedly and came, started coming back up the road, the... Um, uh, the, the soldiers told us to get out and hide behind rocks. Now, there aren't many rocks on the Golan Heights, and they're quite small. So you had um, three or four of us behind a rock the size of a small rubbish bin, which is a bit stupid. So in the end, they told us to get back in the bus, and the bus hurriedly did a U-turn or did several turns to get back in the right direction. And headed off back up the hill, and where we'd been, a shell landed only a few seconds later. So that was pretty good. Jeez, you were a few seconds away from disaster. Yeah, 
Well, it's good. Should I mention um, that you had a close relationship with Saddam Hussein? No, I didn't. I saw him from a distance in 1978 reporting for The Age on a national celebration soon after he came into power. Um, but uh, we saw him in, uh, you know, all the journalists were flown over there and put up very ordinary hotels and that, but to watch the, the march pass, which I think started around 10 p.m. or 11 p.m., went till yeah. four, 4 in the morning with Saddam, you know, including just millions of troops and women troops and male troops and bands and marching past as he, in the middle of the night, saluted them all. So that was that. But um, I tried to get some information from a local journalist and he didn't turn up. And then I got back to my hotel room and my mate from The Sun said, oh, they've been going through your room and they'd gone through all the stuff and the suitcase and... That wasn't very nice, but we eventually got out of the place after um, worrying about whether we would actually get out of Iraq. So do you, <coughs> do you believe that was Saddam that had gone through, well, some of his Yeah, all his, his, security, his, boys. Pe- his security people were right on top of it. You know, this was a, an organisation that eliminated the whole executive of the Communist Party a few weeks before, Be- yeah, right. um, asked his... Uh, had a big meeting in a big theatre or cinema or whatever it was and yep. said, anybody who feels a little uncomfortable at my leadership, please put up your hand. And they, a few did, and, and ushers or military guys um, uh, said, would you mind leaving your seat and coming with us? And uh, no, not at all. So they got out of their seats and went into the aisles and went up the aisles and were taken out the back and shot. Um, but that's life uh, with Saddam Hussein. He was uncompromising. And he also didn't want you back in his country. Oh, no, 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 I wouldn't have gone back. Uh, I wouldn't have gone back, but uh, we, uh, we did have to land once at Baghdad in one plane and uh, I hid under the seat in front, for, which was pretty confined, hoping, they were, hoping nobody would come on board and check passports or anything. Right. Jeez. Very interesting stuff, Dad. Oh, good, Ben. Um, have you got a favourite holiday destination other than Iraq? <laughs> <laughs> or other Syria? Than Iraq? Oh, I suppose France would have to be it because we've got family there. And, of yeah. course, I, I know it pretty well. And, and Paris and um, eating in Paris and, and just walking around Paris would have to be a, a great favourite, probably my most favourite. Maybe we could save that for another podcast another day. All right, Dad. Well, it's been great to talk to you today. We've been my going pleasure, about, uh, how long? About 40, 43 minutes. Oh, that's long. Long. Um, that's enough for one bite. Is that enough for one oh, bite? I think so. You, 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 I think so. Would you like Benjamin. to come back on eventually? Because oh, oh, I've got plenty I'm, more questions. I'm delighted. For you. Be delighted. And I would to like to talk on about, about that cruise that you did have. So, oh, yes. Yeah, so the death we can cruise, talk about the death call cruise. So that's what I'll call that podcast, the okay. death cruise. But we'll talk about that another time. Yep. Uh, so thanks for joining me today. My, it was really pleasure. great. My pleasure. Um, and if anyone wants to uh, contact me, they can contact me at the Travelman Podcast at gmail.com. You can contact me on Instagram. You can look at all my beautiful little pictures, Travelman Podcast. I'm on Facebook, Travelman Podcast. I have a website that I always say is notoriously hard to find. Don't bother with it. You can click in the in the show notes. Um, and uh, yeah, that's about it from from myself and my dad, my dear dad. See My you, dear old dad. See you soon. No, cut the old stuff. All right, I'll cut the old stuff. Okay, thanks. Bye. Bye.